Okay, so what are we talking about today? So when we were talking with the folks that are running this conference, we asked about what kind of topics they wanted to hear. And uh, I was really happy when they didn't just say, let's talk about the standard, like what is fishing, vishing, like what is social engineering. They wanted to get more behind the science of how it works on us as, as people. So that's what we're going to talk about today is a little bit of the science that I've been uh, privileged to be able to work on and, and work with other people on to understand how it is that each of us here is vulnerable to human hacking techniques. But first, I'm going to make a bold statement. And that bold statement is that I can get 75% of you to click on a phishing email in this room. Now, why can I make that statement? And most of you will be saying, oh, that's impossible. You're not going to make it to work. Well, the reason I can say that is because of, I have to click the right thing, because of my track record. So I've sent 13 million fish in my career so far, and our average in that 13 million fish is 75% being able to get people to click. So statistically, the bold statement is that I can get 75% of people to click on a phishing email. Now, while we get into this speech, the one thing I want you to kind of really ponder on is we're not saying that 75% of the people here are stupid. That is not the case. We're going to explain exactly how we can make such a bold statement that 75% of the people could fall for a phishing or other type of social engineering scam. So let's first talk about the history of this. Um, as mentioned, in 2009, I started writing a framework because I wanted to understand how we can educate others about social engineering. And my first basic problem with that was every time I looked up the definition of social engineering, it was something like manipulating someone to do something, uh, making someone to do something they don't want, or there was only videos about how to get free burgers from McDonald's or how to pick up girls. So that was the only thing on the internet about social engineering. And I felt like that's really not defining the problem that we see out in the, in the world and in the business world especially. So I had to come up with a definition for social engineering that resonated with me, and that was this. The act of getting influencing someone to take an action that may or may not be in their best interest. Now, I know this is broad, but I feel a broad definition is important because I think that when we look at how we are influenced daily on the good side, we begin to clearly understand how the bad guys get us to do the very things that they want us to do. So we need to study and understand how our brains work in good parts of influence and the way we're influenced in good ways to, to really get this. Now, I have an example. How many of you have one of these? How many of you have a daughter? Raise your hand if you have a daughter. Okay, so I had, this is my daughter. Now, especially you guys in the room that raised your hand, um, please don't let me be alone in this. But how many of you have done things that you probably would never do with anyone else in the world because she asked you? Come on. And if you're not putting your hand up, you're a liar. That's all there is to it, okay? <laughs> but I definitely have done this more than one time in my life. And here's an example. Can we have a princess tea party while I paint your fingernails and put makeup on you? And there may or may not be pictures of this floating somewhere on the Internet. Now, <laughs> why would I say yes to this? And now you could sit there and go, well, she's your daughter. You love her. So that makes sense. But there's so much more to that when we look at chemically and psychologically how a decision that literally, if after this speech I come down and any one of you say, hey, Chris, you want to go have a princess tea party? It's going to be a different answer, right? <laughs> a much different answer. Jay's going to tackle you, and it's not going to be good. So we're not going to do that. But why would I say yes to her to do that? Well, look at the way our, our chemical reactions happen in our brain. Right, So one of the chemicals that helps us make decisions is dopamine. And when we feel trust, liking, love, we feel those positive emotions with someone else, our brain releases this chemical and we feel happy, we feel positive, and we feel confident in the decisions that we make. So when my daughter comes up, and I'm thinking to myself, there's no way on earth I ever would want fingernail polish and makeup and wearing a pink scarf and let alone have it photographed. That does not make sense to me in any part of my life, but willingly doing it and happily doing it and now telling a room full of people about doing it. <laughs> All of that, why? Because she was able to get my brain to release dopamine because of our emotional relationship and saying yes to that. Now, how does this apply to hacking? Well, that was my question. That was my question that I had was how can we apply this to understanding social engineering and how we fall for different types of social engineering attacks. So I made a, I made a quest and this was it. I wanted to understand how these emotions play a part in our decision-making processes 
and then I want to learn how to exploit them. And I wanted to do this not because I'm a bad guy, but because I wanted to be able to educate others and, hey, here's what's happening in your brain when you get asked these questions or when you get presented with this decision, and here's how we can fix it. Okay, so there's always a way to fix it at the end. So we had to focus on the four vectors because we're not here to talk about our daughters or our kids or other things that we do on the positive side. We're here to talk about how this works when it comes to our four vectors. So if some of these terms are unfamiliar to you, let me just define them briefly. So phishing is email-based attacks, right? And, and that means that anything that comes in your email, regardless if it's looking for passwords, clicks, credentials, whatever it is, this is involving phishing. We see ransomware being sent through phishing, uh, malware, viruses, you know, all those type of things are all coming through phishing emails. So that's, that's the main attack that we see. I believe the latest Verizon DBIR report states that it's still over 87% or so of all attacks involve phishing emails. So we still see this as the most prolific way that social engineering is being used. Next is vishing, which if you can believe this, in 2015, it's a real word in the Oxford Dictionary now. So it's actually made it, we make up words and then they become real. That's kind of cool. Uh, vishing stands for voice phishing. So it's just anything that involves someone calling you on the phone. So maybe some of the ones you've heard about recently are um, the scams like calling your mom and dad or your grandma and grandpa saying they're from the IRS and their social security number has been disabled, right? And they're looking for payment. Or the Microsoft lady calling you saying your computer has bad traffic, they want to help you fix it. Or... The, more, the, more, uh, the ones that we hear more about in business are the BEC scams, right, where they're calling you to do a wire transfer to get you to transfer money out of your corporate accounts into their accounts. These all involve vishing or voice phishing. And then the next one, which is smishing, which is SMS phishing, which we don't see a ton of every day in the wild, but we are seeing an increase in it in the last two years. And here's why. When a bank gets breached, we see smishing happening more. Or healthcare, we see smishing more. And then finally, it looks like the ishing guy took a small vacation and we have impersonation. And that is just, this is the most, this is the least used one for a particular reason. As you can imagine, this means I have to come in person. The risk is higher. I can get caught easier. And of course, if I get caught, the, the damage is a lot higher to me as an attacker. So impersonation is used the least. And these are the four vectors. And I needed to understand how the sciences behind how we make decisions apply to these four vectors. So I started down a path of trying to understand different aspects. And the first one was, was what we call microfacial expressions. Right, so understanding body language and facial expressions and how they work and how they release emotion and how they are affected by emotion. And I had, I had a really wonderful privilege of working with the, like the granddaddy of all the science on this, which is Dr. Paul Ekman. Um, if you're not familiar with that name, you may have seen the show Lie to Me. He was the scientific um, uh, background for that. And he's been writing books since the 60s and studying how facial expressions are affected by emotion and how emotion affect our, fa our facial expressions and what all that means for how we make decisions. So there's a few things that I got to learn from Dr. Ekman. At first is that a microfacial expression or, or an MFE is a 1 25th of a second response to an external emotional stimuli. So what that means is you see something uh, that scares you and you react in fear. Now, it's your whole body, but we see it first on the face, right? And, and then there was something else totally fascinating that he found in 1973 doing his research. And in that year, he found out that the reverse is true, that when you make the facial expression, it actually can create the emotion in you. Okay, now, I believe that they put me here at 9 a.m. to wake you all up. So we're going to do an exercise together as a room. Okay, this is the classic expression of fear. Now, fear is done by the eyes opening really wide. The mouth gets pulled back in an eek position. So you're not just opening it. Oh, you're pulling your mouth back in eek like this, and then you're gasping, and you're like, okay, so we're going to do this all together on the count of three. I want you all to open your eyes as wide as you can, pull your lips back, and gasp in. You don't have to say eek. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. But in your head, you can say it. And then we're going to talk about your feelings about this, okay? So on the count of three, are you ready? One, two, three. Okay, now, just by a show of hands, how many of you got oh, chills or goosebumps when you made that expression? Okay, so a number of you. Now, here's the crazy part. 
Because you aren't feeling fear, I hope. <laughs> if you are, like, this guy really sucks, I'm afraid. What's not, hopefully that's not the case. But if you're, you're sitting here, you're feeling happy, you're, you're enjoying great breakfast, you're enjoying a wonderful conference, and now all of a sudden you make a facial expression and you get chills or goosebumps. Now, if I were to leave this picture up on the screen for the next 15 minutes, guaranteed every one of you would become irritable and you would start to feel anxious. Why? Because our brains have something called mirror neurons in them. And when we view someone else's facial expressions, we begin to feel the emotion that's on their face. So all of this science helps us to understand how we are influenced or at times manipulated into feeling a certain emotion which makes us more vulnerable to certain actions. So you think about the emails that really cause fear, a phone call that really causes fear. There's a horrible scam going around right now where you get a, your, your phone rings, you pick it up, and it's the number of your child. So you say, oh, it's my daughter. I'm going to pick up the phone. And on the, on the other end is a man who says they've kidnapped your child and they're going to do harm to her unless you pay a fee. You pay a ransom. And they want that ransom through iTunes gift cards. So I don't know about you, but even understanding it's a scam, if that were to happen, I may make the decision to just part with the money because of the potential risk. And they're banking on that your fear will be so strong that you'll make the decision to pay the two, three, five thousand dollars to avoid potential harm to your child. And they realize, even though they may not understand the science, that the strength of this kind of science means that we will feel this emotion and it will affect the way that we make decisions. Now, because I don't want you to feel anxious or afraid for the rest of the speech, we're going to end on something happy. And this is a great happy face. Now, happy is, this is an amazing emotion. It's a complex emotion. But happiness is not just what you see in the mouth. Does anyone know where happiness is really shown? I heard it. Someone said it, the eyes. So there's a nerve that runs through our, the, our, our part of our head here called the ocularis orbitalis nerve. And it actually creates what we call crow's feet. And when someone is truly happy, that's where you see it, is in the eyes. So if you want to, let's all smile now by getting our eyes activated. All that fear will go away, and you will no longer... Yeah, people are saying, I don't want crow's feet. Screw you. Okay, well, just do it anyway, because you don't want to feel anxious, right? But it's, it's good for us. This is a great emotion that also makes us have positive reactions to decision-making. It actually helps us make better decisions. Okay, now that was the first science. The second science that I got to, got to study and, and look at was the study of oxytocin. Now, just to be clear, I didn't do any of these studies. I got to read, talk to, and work with the people who did them. Now, this study is really fascinating. It was done by a, a, a researcher called Dr. Paul Zak. He wrote a book called The Moral Molecule, and he decided to research in this molecule called oxytocin. Now, for many, many, many years, and this will show you how terribly chauvinistic the research uh, areas are, they ignored it because they thought it was just, an emo uh, just a chemical that affected women after they gave birth. But some researchers said, I don't think that's true. We see it a lot more often. It's just really hard to capture. And Dr. Zach, through some much research, figured out that the reason for that is it has a very short shelf life. So when oxytocin is released in the brain, it may only be alive for a few minutes, and it has to be continually released. And they found it, yes, during childbirth, during breastfeeding, during um, intercourse, and, but also during some really fascinating times, interacting with people that you really like, interacting with people on social media that you really like, if you can believe that, interacting with people that you find attractive. And here's the big one, interacting with people that you feel they trust you. Now, just let that sink in for a second. So it's not that you trust them. It's not that I make you trust me and all of a sudden oxytocin is released. It's me making you believe that I trust you. So if I were to say to you, I have a secret. I want this room to know. I haven't told anyone yet in the world. And you were to believe me, your brain starts to release oxytocin. And I'm your drug dealer. So that means that your release of oxytocin is thanks to me. You feel good. And now every time you even see a picture of me on social media... It releases that same chemical, and we have a bond. Now, this is powerful. Dr. Zach told me a story when I interviewed him on my podcast about how he was, um, he was fall victim for this exact scam because of this, something called the pigeon drop, where he actually was a young man working in a gas station, and a guy had come in saying, hey, I was using the bathroom, and I found this box on the back of, of the toilet. I don't know what it is, but I thought I turned it into lost and found. 
Paul opens it up, and inside is a whole lot of jewels. They look like really expensive diamonds and rubies and other big pieces of jewelry. Just at that moment, the phone rings. A guy on the other end says, I was just in your gas station. I used the bathroom. I think I left a box in the bathroom. Can you please go check? And he goes, hey, you're a lucky day. There's a guy right here who just handed the box in. The guy says, this is amazing. Tell him he's a hero. I'm going to give him a $200 reward. Tell him to wait. Hangs up the phone. So he tells the guy, this is your lucky day. You're such an honest man. You wait here. This guy's coming. You get 200 bucks. The guy says, man, I can't wait. I'm on my way to a job interview. I'm supposed to go. I have six interviews today. I've been out of work for like six months. I need to go. And Paul says, well, but I don't know what to do. You're getting a reward. You should stay. This is a lot of money. This was back in the 70s, 200 bucks, a lot of money. The guy says, I got an idea because you're such a nice kid. Why don't you take 100 bucks out of the till and give it to me? When this guy comes with $200, you can put the 100 bucks back. You keep 100 for yourself. And he's like, why would you do that? He's like, you're a nice kid and I trust you. Well, Paul made the decision to open the till, give him 100 bucks, and this is what they call the pigeon drop. So that guy, of course, wasn't a real hero. Those jewels were all glass, and he was never get, getting the $100 back. And he lost his job for that. How sad that, that story. But we understand that this, this molecule, oxytocin, when we feel it get released by an attacker, it's almost impossible for our brains not to feel trust for that person. So another fascinating study that we got to, to look at here. And then the third, which probably is the most influential for me in understanding how we fall victim to attack, is looking into uh, some research that was done by, um, by a, uh, a man named Dr. Daniel Goleman. And he coined this phrase called the amygdala hijacking. Now, just so we can understand what the amygdala is, uh, it's pointed out there. It is not green in the brain, but that is just easy for us to see. There's two amygdala, and they are uh, small, tiny, walnut-shaped sizes, sized piece of gray matter that have very specific functions in our brains, and this is fascinating. So all of our five senses take in external stimuli, and they all get processed through the amygdala before our brain kicks in. Now, we're like, why do we need to understand all this at 9 in the morning? Because this is the important part of how we get hacked. So think of this. You're walking through your yard, and let's say you're deathly afraid of snakes. And out of the corner of your eye, you think you perceive a giant black snake. And what happens? <gasps> You have the fear reaction, you reel back, you breathe in, and then your brain catches up, and you're like, oh, it's just a garden hose. Dang it, my kid left the hose out again. And the fear goes away, and your brain says you're safe. You do not need to run. You don't need to fight or flight. You can just laugh it off and move on. And that fear response is a safety mechanism for us. Well, our amygdala is the part of our brain that triggers that initial <sighs> fear response in us when we see our, our, our external visual cortices, see the, the black hose, and we think it's a snake because we're deathly afraid of snakes. And here's the fascinating part of what he found, is that when he analyzed how the brain works when under emotional duress by using students and what they call an fMRI helmet, he was able to see that when the brain was feeling certain emotions, as you can see in this graph, that much of the brain's emotional centers were lit up. But here is what was not, the logic centers. And he, in his study, he did this fascinating piece of research where he gave students math problems, math problems that they were able to solve, so they weren't impossible. And he timed them, how long it took them to solve these math problems. Then he showed them a video that was 60 to 90 seconds, something very scary, something that would induce fear in them. And then while wearing the helmet, he gave them the same kind of math problems, and all of them took sometimes 200, 300, or more percent longer to solve those very same math problems. And what he saw was what we see here in this graph, is that when they were high in emotional state, especially fear, sadness, anger, they were unable to have their logic centers kick in, which means they were trying to do this math without their logic and reasoning centers and only based on emotion. Now let's translate that to you and I. We get an email. You may have done this. And this person that emails you just ticked you off. For the last time, they said something that just makes you mad. And you type your response, and it's not pleasant, and you hit send. And then you stand up and go, oh, my God, what did I just do? Can I take that back? You ever see that commercial, that guy running around trying to unplug the whole Internet? He wants to do it, right? We've all been there. And by your nods and smiles, I can see how many of you did exactly what I have done a million times. So we've been there. What happens? Well, our amygdala got hijacked. 
our logic and reasoning centers were shut off because we felt anger. And when we felt that anger, we made a decision to say something and do something that later on when logic came back, we went, oh, that was really stupid. So this happens when we're under attack. An attacker will try to elicit fear in you, anger, lust, greed, these other feelings and emotions that shut down your logic centers. And when it works, you make decisions completely not based on logic and reason, but you make decisions based purely on emotion. And this study truly fascinated me in how we can understand human hacking. So let me give you a case study to explain how this works so we could tie it all together. Here's some of the facts of the case study. We had a job where we had 1,000 people that we were supposed to attack. So we developed a phishing scheme where we bought a domain. Let's just say the company name was company. So their, their URL was company.com. We bought a domain that was uh, updates-company.com. That was a domain we bought. And then we cloned their website so we had the right banners. And we made a page that all it asked for was their domain credentials, and th which was their username and password for their domain credentials. That was it. And it had a beautiful picture of an iPhone on it, brand new iPhone. And then we sent this email out to 1,000 people and we said, we're raffling off 10 brand new iPhones. To be included in the raffle, all you have to do is go to our corporate website at this URL, input your domain credentials, and you'll automatically be entered. I sent this email, 1,000 people all at once. Can you guess how many people gave me their domain credentials? 75%, okay? <laughs> 750 domain credentials, which even for me at this time was a little shocking. I was like... That's more than I expected. I didn't know we were going to get that many, so I had to decide what do we do next because that was only one phase of the attack. So we picked 25 of the highest-ranking people in this organization, and we said we're going to call them on the phone, and I'm going to pretend that I am tech support and that in, as tech support, I'm going to say, man, we just caught that you clicked on a fish, and now you have a virus on your machine. And I need you to go to this website, which, by the way, was the same exact website they just went to. I need you to download this EXE file that is called company-pc cleaner, and I need you to install it, and it will clean the virus from your machine. And that was not really a cleaner, as you can imagine. It was a interpreter reverse shell, which meant that we were going to gain remote access to their machine if they were to install it. Now, let's take a, let's take a listen to this phone call. So you can hear how it went, and I put some notes here to, so we can understand how these studies apply during this type of an attack. You, did your password change? Yes, I did. Okay, excellent. Just wanted to tell you that was really good. That's the way it should have been handled. Okay, yeah. Uh, as soon as we realized it, two of us jumped right on it. Okay, so there was another guy in your team that also? Yeah, I think it was JR. JR, okay. I'm just going to write down. I'll be talking to him later on. So... Uh, just to follow up what we're doing, is, are you on the VPN right now? You're on your work machine? Yes. Okay, I'm going to give you an internal um, address. It's an FTP site that we set up uh, for the employees. You can go there. You can see there's one file there that you'll be able to download, and it will just clean up any residual mess from that website. Okay. So if you're at your machine, just open okay. up a browser, and I'll give you the address. Type in FTP. FTP? Yep, F as in Frank, T okay. as in Tom, and then P as in Paul, and then a colon, and then two slashes, and these are the slashes that are by your question mark, the same button as your question mark. Gotcha, FTP, okay. And then the word is update, dash, and the dash like the minus sign. Gotcha. Dot com. Okay. And, and when you go there, it should open up, it should say index of, and it should have one file. There's a file called PC Checker. Okay, you know it's here. Okay, double click on that. Yeah, click on that. Okay. And it should it should download. Okay. So or it should ask you if you want to run or save. Yet yeah, click run. Okay. And if everything goes good, you should get no alerts. You know, if if you have a residual problem from that site, then you'll get a message. But if nothing happens and everything's clean and good and and we're done. Okay, I just got a second thing. I said the pub publisher could not be verified. Are you sure you want to run this software? Yeah, click OK. Run again? Okay. Okay, now it took me back to the original screen. Okay, yeah. that's good. So if you've got no error message, then, then you're good to go. You're, you're clean. Okay, well, thanks for the help.
Not a problem. We'll talk to you later. Yeah. Okay, so we got caught at one point, right? He said, it just popped up an error message. Now what? And I'm like, yeah, just click through it thinking we're, we're done. And he clicked through it. So we had shell, right? So when you're sitting there, and don't raise your hand for this, but when you're sitting there, how many of you can identify with this? Say, you know, that didn't sound like a scam call. That didn't sound unrealistic. I just clicked on an email. This guy's calling from a number that says IT. It sounds like it could be legit. Maybe I would fall for that. Sometimes in this industry, we use this phrase. There's no patch for human stupidity. And I want to say that that's a terribly wrong phrase because that implies that if you ever fall for a social engineering attack, you must be stupid. And I can't get with that phrase. And I'll tell you why. And here's another really embarrassing story. I just want to remind you while I tell you this because I have to boost my ego a little bit because this is terribly embarrassing. 13 million phishing emails, and that book that's under there is a book that I wrote on the psychology of how phishing works. And it was co-written uh, with a woman who's a field-trained psychologist, and she was a U.S. Air Force Academy professor. And we wrote this book together about how phishing works from a psychological perspective. So I feel like I know a little bit about phishing. But I'm an Amazon junkie. Like, I'm one of those guys that, like, if you go, if I'm at a store with my wife and we're shopping, I'm on the app, and I'm like, can get it on Amazon, 13 cents cheaper, buy now. And she's like, you're a moron, right? You can get it now for 13 cents more. And I'm like, two-day shipping, bam. And now they came out with Prime Now. Have you heard about this app? That is like crack for us junkies. I mean, it is unbelievable. Like, you can buy a thing, and it's at your house in 30 minutes. I can literally never leave home again, right? It's the best thing that ever happened. Now, I don't normally tell everyone this, but I'm telling people now because this story is just way too, way too powerful. I'm preparing for a conference that we go to called DEF CON, and we hold a competition out there for little kids where we teach them how to hack stuff and we teach them how to get up handcuffs, good life skills, you know, for kids. So we're, we're, we have all this stuff ordered from Amazon, uh, like 30 boxes coming to this guy's house that he's going to collect them all and bring them over to DEF CON for us. And I'm packing my office up, and it looks like, like a bomb went off in my office. It's just awful. It's a mess. And I get an email that says, your recent Amazon order will not be delivered due to a declined credit card. Now, the logic part of my brain says, that's impossible. Like, you know, my Amex has never been uh, not, not accepted, but I don't think that way. I go, crap, I can't have these boxes not delivered. The competition's like in two days. So I click the link, and a page opens up, and it looks just like an Amazon login page. Exactly. And... I go to log in. Now, I'm one of those guys that has my username saved, but not the password. So I go and I start typing my password in, and then I realize that my username is not there. And I'm like, well, that's odd. When did, why is the, my username there? And I look up at the URL bar, and it was like something, something, something dot ru. And I'm like, the Russians got me, right? That's, that's always the Russians. And I'm like, I just got, I just got fished. And I'm like, Never tell anyone, you know, so delete the email, clean the computer, wipe that under the rug, bury the body in the backyard and be like, no one will ever know. And then I'm telling my team and they're like, tell everyone. And I'm like, no, this is a horrible story and it's humiliating. And they're like, but if you can fall for it, then maybe other people will feel okay that they fall for it. And I'm like, logic. I don't like it when it's used against me, but it's a good story because what's the purpose of understanding this? Let's think about the studies that we just talked about. That was the right emotional trigger at the right time for me. Now, maybe you hate Amazon. Maybe you never shop on Amazon, so that email wouldn't work on you, but maybe another one would. Maybe if your emotional trigger was exploited, you'd be able to click on that email and you'd fall for that one. But for me, that's what worked. Now, I went back just so you know and looked at the email, and here's the crazy part. I don't think they actually knew that that was my emotional trigger. They just got lucky because the, the email, the, or, the order that wasn't being shipped was for Lee Press-On nails and a George Foreman grill. And I've never ordered those two things. Well, I've never ordered those two things together, not for, not for DEF CON, right? So, I mean, it's like if I had just thought about that, read the email, like scrolled one pixel down, I would have been like, this is fake. I didn't order those things for a kid's competition. And I would have realized it was a scam mail, but I did everything that I tell my clients to not do. I clicked the link instead of opening the browser and going to the domain. I didn't read the whole email, and then I automatically reacted in an emotional state and started entering my password. So the question comes up 
of how can we fix it? Well, there's a few steps that I want to talk about um, before we get to our Q&A. The first, which is probably the most important, is that you have to realize it's okay to wait. It's okay to take a break. You want to know what the fix that Dr. Um, um, Dr. Goldman found in his research that returned students to a normal ability to process their math problems was a 30-second pause. That's it. So after the emotional video, the fear-inducing video, he allowed them 30 seconds with no emotional content, and their brains were allowed to return back to normal processing function, and they were able to do math. So I, have a, I, had, a, I had a rule I used to say. When you get that um, uh, email that really ticks you off or creates an emotion, get up and walk away. I'm going to tell you, that doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for me. You want to know why? Because while I'm walking around getting coffee or a glass of water, I'm thinking about how angry that person made me. So here's what I do. I write the email with all of its inflammatory content and bad words and anger, and then I leave before I click send. I get up, I get my water, I come back, and I read the email to myself, and I go, oh, dear God, I'm glad I didn't say that. Let's delete that paragraph. You know, let's delete all these words. You know, find, replace, F word, gone. You know, so you do these things where you can fix the problem that you were just about to create. Why? Because I took away that time where the emotion was the only thing I was thinking about. And now I was able to think logically. So it's, you have to tell yourself, it's okay to wait. You know, in this society today, we think everything must be instantaneous. And if it's not instantaneous, we're wrong. I was talking to a, um, a, a lady yesterday who said that she literally will get emails at 8.30 at night. They know she's in Eastern time. And she'll get yelled at because they're not answered within 30 minutes. That's three hours past her, her end of her day. We're expecting instantaneous results today. And attackers know that. They know that we'll move quick. So tell yourself it's okay to wait. Second is educate the weakness, reward the positive. So what does that mean? When you see that you're weak in an area, you need to find education for that area. So maybe you're great at fishing. Fishing never gets through, but maybe the phone is bad. So you need to educate yourself on what is fishing, what are the vectors. And then if you're here as a corporate person doing this for your corporation or your organization and you're part of the education process, this is much better than shame and fear. So if you're working on security awareness uh, protocols for your organization, keep this in mind. Educate the weakness, reward the positive. I find that when you reward positive behavior, it works so much better than shame and fear and, and embarrassment. Third is use technology to safeguard, but it's not the savior. Let me ask you. I'm going I'm to give you a two-part question. I want you to think about it, then we'll raise our hands. Is antivirus a security tool or an administration tool? Raise your hand if you say it's a security tool. Raise your hand if you say it's an administration tool. And then some of you didn't guess, and that's fine. Now, let me tell you my viewpoints, and I'm not saying that anyone who voted differently is wrong, but I personally feel it's an administration tool, not a security tool. Now, that doesn't mean don't get it. You need antivirus on your computer. You should have antivirus on your computer. But think about this. Antivirus only saves you from known viruses. So a virus, antivirus software package only works on signatures of viruses that have already been found, identified, and cataloged. If it's an O-Day, if it's a brand new virus, if it's a new type of attack, antivirus is useless. That doesn't mean don't have it. But don't say to yourself, well, I have antivirus. I can't be fished. I'm secure. It doesn't work that way. So we want to have the proper balance of technology, but then realize where technology fails because humans are, are there, and we can't get rid of them, and we don't want to get rid of them. So we need to have other things that help with fixing the human side of the problem. Fourth, actionable policies. Now, what does that mean? Uh, we, I, I actually saw this in a client once. Here was their policy for phishing. Do not click on bad links. Sounds good, right? No, it's not. And let me tell you why. First of all, have you identified to the employee what is a bad link? How do they know what a bad link is? What does it mean if they click then? What should they do? What if there's a mistake happens? Should they not tell anyone? How do they report it? How do they identify if they do click a link that they didn't know was bad that now it is bad? So all of these things are not involved in that policy. Just don't click on bad links. And when you leave the power in the hands of your population, of your employees, that will always fail because you're going to have people who don't even know what phishing is. And when you say don't click on bad links, it'll be like, well, it didn't say evilhacker.com. 
You know, it said updates-company.com. That's not a bad link, right? It had my company name in it. So you have to make po policies that are actionable, clearly defined and understandable by your people so they can react on the proper way, the way that you want. And fifth and final is realistic testing. And when I say this from the top down, what I mean is that you can't, it can't be the CEO sitting on his throne with his scepter saying, test all of my subjects, but I am unhackable. It can't be that. Every company that I've ever worked with that had testing from the CEO down are the ones that always do the best. Because everybody underneath them says, you know what, my boss is doing it, I guess I can't, you know, how am I going to argue this? He's taking part of it. So if, you're, if you are working with a company or you're within a company that you are involved in this decision-making process, really push to have your realistic testing from the top down. And when I say realistic testing, what does that mean? Does it mean like guys have to come in black masks and, you know, beat everybody up? No. It doesn't need to be level four hardcore phishing emails every month, but it needs to be real. And what does that mean is what is happening out in the wild today? We need to use those themes, those vectors, those type of attacks so people understand what it is that they're going to experience when they're out on the Internet. I, I use this analogy often that if you wanted to learn how to fight, let's say a martial art or a boxing class, and you went into a boxing gym and you said, hey, coach, I want to learn how to box. And the boxing coach put you down in front of a computer, showed you a 20-minute CBD, and then said, hey, in the ring, Mike Tyson's there. You'd be like, I'm out, right? Because you're like, I'm not prepared for this. But that's what we do to our people all the time. We say, hey, fishing is horrible. Fishing is terrible. Social engineers are bad. Hey, watch this video. And then once a year, you get to watch it again. Now go protect my data. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. We need to actually test them. What you would expect from your boxing coach is he would put protective gear on you. He'd bring you over to the heavy bag. He would show you how to punch. He would show you how to take a punch. Then eventually, when you were ready, you'd get in the ring with someone who didn't want to kill you, what they call a sparring partner. They'd want to test your, your ability to block, to hit, to take a punch, to not die when you're being hit. Eventually, you may actually get into a real fight, in the ring, hopefully, not out in public. And you would be able to sustain yourself on that. But you wouldn't do that day one. And that is the way we should approach realistic testing is of that, that matter. At least that's my opinion on it. Okay, so these five steps are the way that we can really produce a security conscious and security safe uh, network and population. And the sciences behind it prove that these things work, work marvels. Um, if there's any more questions, I can be, feel free to chat with people um, afterward. Thank you all for coming out. And again, thank you for your support with the ILF.